Good morning, and thank you so much for being with us today. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. We'll spend some time in the book of Habakkuk uh, today here with us. We've been, um, in the times that I've been here, um, going through Habakkuk with the idea of, of understanding what it means to have calm in the chaos. Now, Habakkuk, for those of you not familiar, is one of the minor prophets. And what a minor prophet is, it's not that it's less significant than the major prophets, but a minor prophet are just a shorter version of the prophets. And these minor prophets oftentimes are ones that don't get studied a whole lot. We don't, I think if you do a Google search of sermons on Habakkuk, you're not going to find a bunch of them. Uh, it's a relatively small book of the Bible. It's just three chapters. But the lessons here are very powerful. And when we spend time here in the Minor Prophets, we understand a little bit better about how God interacts with his people. We understand more about grace, mercy, and judgment in this section more so than I think many others that we see in Scripture. When I studied the Minor Prophets, uh, when I was in the preacher training classes in Danville, Steve Wolfgang shared a quote with us about Homer Haley. And Haley is one of the foremost authorities on the Minor Prophets. He wrote a commentary that anybody that's ever spent any time studying has no doubt spent some time with. But Haley, toward the end of his life, was interviewed. And they were talking about his life and his experiences in preaching. And they asked Haley about why he had spent so much time in the Minor Prophets and why he continued to do a lot of work there. And Haley's comment always stuck with me. He said, you know, I'm, again, he's in his late 80s, early 90s. He said, all my friends have passed away. I've lost my wife. And he said, but these minor prophets have been my best friend for 50 years. These 13 characters have helped me through the ups and downs and good and bad in life. And I always thought that was kind of refreshing. That he had spent so much time that he considered them like they were old friends. And I think as we study through the Minor Prophets together, as we spend some time here, and hopefully this series has helped you maybe spend a little more time there or do some digging, I think we'll find a lot of truth that's there that sometimes, again, gets lost in the shuffle. This series that we started here back, goodness, I think it was sometime last fall when I first came, is the idea of in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of calamity, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of chaos, how do we stay calm? How do we find calm within ourselves? And we began, and we're not, I'm not going to take the time this morning to re-preach all the other sermons, but to get you caught up, the first idea we looked at was the idea of the faith paradox. That within our faith, we have this paradox that says no matter how brutal our current circumstances and current situation is, we have to face those brutal facts without giving up that in the end we will prevail. That because we have faith, it doesn't mean that our circumstances may not be terrible at times, but that doesn't change the ultimate goal that we will prevail in the end. And then secondly, we looked at the idea of God's mysterious ways. That not all we know of God is all there is to know of God. That God does some things that, quite honestly, don't make any sense to us because we're looking at life from a temporary timeline and God's looking from eternity. So there are things that God does and ways in which God moves that we'll never understand. But quite honestly, we're not supposed to. He's God. And we're not. And we have to get our mind around the fact that God's ways are mysterious and higher than our ways. The third lesson was about how we find calm by being calm. That sometimes in the middle of our chaos, the best way that we can find that peace again is to stop, to look, and to listen. That if we'll calm our hearts and calm our minds, if we'll look around at all that God has done... And then listen to what God is doing that we can find peace knowing that God is sovereign and God is in control. Our fourth lesson was about the judged and the just. The fact that all of us ultimately will appear before God and all wrongs will be righted in the end. 
The just will go on to their reward and the judge will go on to their punishment. And it's not our responsibility or our work to do either the judging or the part about being just. We have our role and God has his role. In the end, everything that we are worried about will be taken care of. The fourth lesson, or I'm sorry, the fifth lesson was about a trinity of positivity. And we looked at within some very hard sayings about the judgment both of Israel and about the judgment that's coming to Babylon, that even within there, there's mercy, there's grace, and there's redemption. That sometimes in Scripture, when we think things are the worst, that really if we'll read carefully, we see positive notes that we can hang our hat on, positive things that we can look forward to. And the last lesson that we spent time with was about a prayer for vision and revival. About how we need to be praying for our congregations. We need to be praying for our church family. And we need to be looking forward to that revival and the work that it's going to take to get there. That that's what we can do to be active in moving things along is to spend time with God. And this morning, we're going to spend time, this is our last lesson in this series. But the lesson this morning is about choosing joy. What would you say if I told you that God is unconcerned with whether or not you're happy? That God has no care in the world for whether or not you're happy. Now, some of you may start thinking that, well, Mike's lost his mind. Of course, God wants me to be happy. People say that all the time. That's the justification for sin, right? God just wants him to be happy. So if I'm unhappy with my current wife, I could trade her in for a newer model. That if I'm unhappy with the way I view things, I'll just change them. God just wants me to be happy after all, right? Well, no, God doesn't care at all about your happiness. What God wants for us is something far deeper. You see, happiness and being happy is a fleeting emotion. Adam and I could be joking around, teasing each other. And laughing and having a good time until I make fun of his truck. And then now he's upset. So we went in a moment from being happy to being angry. To being offended. To being upset. You see, that is a temporary emotion. And it's fleeting. What God wants for us is deeper than that. God wants joy. Joy is a long-term state of mind. Joy is something that cannot be taken away from us based on our situation and our circumstances. But friends, the most important thing I'm going to tell you this morning, if you hear nothing else that I say for the next 20 minutes, half hour, two hours, however long I keep talking, the most important thing I want you to understand is that joy is a choice. It is not dictated by your circumstances. Happiness is dictated by our circumstances. As long as I'm having a good time, I could be happy. But joy is a peace that I can have regardless of my circumstances. If the world is falling down around me, I can still have joy and no one can take that away from me. But it's a conscious choice. In life, there are very few things that we have control over. And that may come as a surprise to some of you, but there's very few things we have control over. We can't control the economy. We can't control our government. We can't control our elected officials. We can't control the decisions and choices of other people. You know what we can control? Ourselves and our own disposition. I can control the next choice that I make. I can't control my wife or my kids or what the church is going to do, but I can control my next choice, my next decision. How I'm going to react in the midst of difficult circumstances. Every time I think about joy, I think about Joseph. Now many of us know the life of Joseph and his ups and downs that he had, right? Joseph went from being the favorite of 12 children to being lauded by his parents, coat of many colors, to his brothers deciding first they were going to murder him and then it'd be more humane if they just sold him into slavery and told dad that he was killed by wild beasts. Joseph goes on down into Egypt, gets elevated from being a slave to being the head of all of Potiphar's house. 
And what does he get as a reward for that? Potiphar's wife lies on him and he ends up in prison. But as he's in prison, he continues to do what is under his control and he gets elevated to where, as a prisoner, the chief guard of the prisoners have him in control of all the other prisoners. And one of the most ironic pieces of all of Scripture happens in this story that one day as the king's chief cup maker and our chief cuff bearer and baker are thrown into prison... Joseph's up doing his rounds and he walks by these guys and says, men, why have your countenance fallen? Now, to me, that's the most ironic thing in the world. Buddy, we're in jail. Why do you think we're sad? Why do you think we're upset? But Joseph here, who has all the reason in the world to be bitter, all the reason in the world to be mad at his circumstances and the fact that he's in jail, is wondering why these guys are sad today. You see, Joseph made a choice. He decided that regardless of his circumstances, his disposition would not be affected by that. By other sins, by the fact that he was the consequences of many other sins, his life was turned upside down by other sins. Again, all the reason in the world to be angry, to be bitter, to be discontent, to be sour, all of those reasons, nobody would blame Joseph for being a jerk. But he made a choice. And he said, not only am I going to keep my disposition up, not only am I going to choose joy, but other prisoners, I'm going to help you choose joy as well. What's troubling you? Let's talk about it. Let's get through this. Ultimately, that choice is the linchpin that gets him in front of Pharaoh and being over everything in the kingdom that leads to the redemption during the famine of his family and his people. But all of those dominoes don't fall. He never ends up in that situation if he doesn't make a choice for joy. If he doesn't make a choice, excuse me, to be better. So let's read here in Habakkuk chapter 3, and I want us to think about all that's going on. And remember the story here of Habakkuk, for those of you that haven't been with us, In Habakkuk, the first chapter begins with Habakkuk's call to God. And Habakkuk calls out to God and says, God, these people are terrible. They won't do anything with the law. Justice is perverted. It's awful. And how long are you going to let this happen? And God responds to Habakkuk and says, I'm getting ready to do something about it, and you're not going to like it. And he explains to Habakkuk what he's going to do, and Habakkuk backs up. And says, God, wait a minute, you're a good God. You can't use bad people to punish us. I know I said we deserve it, but you can't do this. And God explains to him that I'm God and I can do whatever I want. And that when punishing happens, I'm going to go get the best people that are the best at punishing. And that's who I'm going to use. But don't worry about that. I'm going to punish them later for all the bad things that they do too. And then we get to chapter 3. And in chapter 3... Habakkuk is taking all of this in and understanding where he fits in the grand scheme of things and rethinking his conversation with God. And we get down to verse 16. Um, Yeah, verse 16. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. So I'm, I'm going to do a little translating here to put Habakkuk's words into what you and I can understand. I'm overwhelmed, God, by all the things that you just said. I am completely overwhelmed about the magnitude of what's going on. But in that overwhelming point, in the chaos of everything that's folding around me, and my understanding of what you're going to do, while it makes me sick, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to wait quietly for these things to unfold. Because I know, no matter how terrible they get, you are still in control. Friends, we read about in our previous studies, the destruction 
of Jerusalem and the destruction of the nation of Israel, how terrible it was. We read from the Proverbs about how the women and children were dashed against the rocks. We read from the end of Jeremiah and Chronicles where it talks about how one stone wasn't laid upon another. And we talked about how utterly devastating it was that not only was everything wiped out, but anything that was good that was left in the city was taken back to Babylon, including Daniel and his three friends. All good was carried out, and all that was left behind was destruction. And Habakkuk the prophet, who sought justice and sought what was needed to come to these people, was faced with what justice looks like. But here's the lesson that you and I learn from this. Is that none of us want justice. There's nobody here that wants justice. We want mercy and grace and forgiveness. None of us want justice because we understand as we look at Habakkuk and we look at the end of the judgment day, we understand how terrible justice really is. None of us want justice. We may in the moment in a heat of anger, want somebody to get what's coming to them. But here's what we find out about life the older we get. Life is not black and white. There are bad people that do good things. And there are good people that occasionally do bad things. And sometimes it's hard to sort out who's good and who's bad. Are you really a terrible person that just happens to do something good? Or are you a good person that's just made a mistake? And we find that life, instead of being black and white, is just various shades of gray. And while we're searching for the truth and what's right and striving to be on that straight and narrow, what we find is sometimes even the best of us are doing pretty bad things. And sometimes we see people that are terrible people that are doing better things than we are. We don't want justice. We want mercy. We want grace. We want redemption. We want God to see the best that's in us and forgive us of our flaws and our wrongs. That's what we really, truly want. Because what we understand is when judgment comes, it's final. And those that we love and those that we care about are not going to have any more time. Anybody that we love that hasn't made their life right in the eyes of God is going to be lost and that's forever. You're not just on the outskirts of camp, you're gone. So how do we, when we know that that judgment's coming, how do I find and choose joy? Because as we said before just a minute ago, this is a conscious choice. The first part of this in choosing joy is understanding that God will always make the right decisions. That when we say someone's life, someone's soul, someone's account is in the hands of a merciful and loving God, do we really mean it? I hope we do. I hope we understand that God's going to sort all this stuff out. And that God will forgive where he wants to forgive and grant grace where he wants to grant grace. And all of our hope is that there's plenty enough grace that's out there for all those that we love. Choosing joy is about understanding that God always makes the right decision. But part of that decision that God makes is the patience and slowness that he has right now. And what Peter writes, that God is not slow as some men count slackness, but is patient, wishing what? All men everywhere to repent. God's slowness is patience. God wants forgiveness and redemption for all and will give us every opportunity to get there. And those that we love as God is being patient, as we sometimes get frustrated, God, how long can you let these people continue to act this way? And our nation who, you know, used to have some morals and values doesn't anymore. And God, how long are you going to put up with this? We got to understand that when we get frustrated in those moments, that that judgment when it comes is final. 
and the patience that God is allowing and extending, while we may feel at the time God's allowing these awful people to get away with stuff, we need to refocus and understand that we can have some peace and joy knowing that God's given us a little more time to try to be salt and light, to try to convince those that we love to make better decisions and better choices. Part of our choosing joy is about our in-depth understanding of the finality of life. And at the end, those that belong to God go on home to peace and comfort. But those that are lost are lost. We have to understand that regardless of what it may appear that they're getting away with today, that it's God's patience. And we need to understand if we're honest with our own lives, there were a lot of days that we needed God's patience to correct our own problems, right? I'm thankful for God's patience. I'm thankful that in the days when I acted a fool, there was God's patience until I could be restored. If we're honest with our lives and our situations, we can be thankful and have joy in God's patience because he was patient for me and he's patient for those that I love and those that I care about. And he's still patient giving them opportunity to change. Giving them opportunity to come back home. And many of you may be thinking, yeah, Mike, this sounds all well and fine academically. But what about when things are really bad? What about when it's really hard? I mean, you're telling me I can choose joy regardless of my circumstances, but what about the really hard, terrible, awful things? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the herd, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So let's stay here in 17 for a minute. This is an agricultural-based society, right? What happens when the vines don't produce fruit? We don't got food. What happens when there's no herd in the stalls? We're not eating. You and I think sometimes that we go through difficult situations. But friends, our problems are not these kind of problems. The poor in our society are the 1% in many cultures around the world. Our poor here, the basic necessities that we have in the United States, we have to understand that we won the life's lottery when we were born here in the United States. Because our poor, the basic necessities that we provide for our poor would make you wealthy in the jungles of Vietnam. Would make you wealthy in sub-Saharan Africa. That what we take for granted is something that they have days where they worry about. Oftentimes with you and I, what, when we say there's nothing to eat in the house, what do we mean? I mean, we mean there's nothing we like to eat in the house, right? We may have a pantry full of stuff and complain that there's nothing to eat in the house. There's food. We may not like what we got at the moment. We may want something different. But understand what Habakkuk is writing here. He said, there is no food to be had. There's not that we need to go to the grocery store or we need to go hunting. or we need to, There's nothing to be had. The stalls are empty. The vines are barren. There is no food. They have to leave and migrate to find food. And we remember that from our biblical history here that after the destruction the Jews were scattered all over the world some went back into captivity at Babylon 
but many fled into Egypt and into other parts of the world because the place was utterly decimated. They had horrible times. But yet, even in that situation, I can rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, some of you, as we read this, are thinking, that's crazy. How in the world could you do that? Wouldn't we expect to be depressed and sorrowful and sullen? Isn't that a natural expectation of being without, of being hungry, of being homeless, of being afraid? Shouldn't we expect to have those feelings? I think that's a valid question. But I think if our expectation is that there's no other choice, then we're not being honest with the text. Read again what he's saying here. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So in this distress, what's Habakkuk saying? That I'm not going to run from God. I'm going to run to God. Because God is the answer to the problems here. But wait, didn't we just say a couple of chapters ago God was the reason that all this stuff happened? Did, does God deserve the blame for all this? No, 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 no. Remember, read the text. Who's to blame for their destruction? They are. Everybody remembers their Old Testament history. Remember the end of the book of Deuteronomy? Right before they're getting ready to go into the promised land, Moses is educating the people on what happens and for a couple of chapters he says if you follow me here's all the things I'm going to do for you and there's lists of how far they'll extend the power that they'll have the reach that they'll have the wealth that they'll have but then he says if you leave me and if you follow other gods and you play the harlot then here's the destruction that'll come you know what's Amazing when we think about those verses in Deuteronomy. Every last one of them came true. All the good that God promised them when they were faithful happened. And then when they were unfaithful, all of the bad that God promised them happened. But whose fault was it? It was their choice. It was their choice. It's not God's fault. Because God told them exactly in the very beginning before they went into the promised land exactly how all this stuff would unfold. They made a choice. That's the theme of this lesson that I want us to understand. Our choices are what define us. And they chose to leave God and felt the consequences of what happened when we leave God. But Habakkuk is saying the faithful, those that belong to God, those that trust in God, will run to God. Because God is the only answer. Let's read one more verse. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Because the follow-up question to all of this is how? My God, this all sounds wonderful. It all sounds great academically. But how in the world do we pull any of this off? The answer to that is you don't. I don't. We can. Listen to where the strength comes from. God, the Lord, is my strength. God is the one that gives us the strength to do hard things. To choose joy. That's why it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's because you can't have it without God. You can't have that calm and that long lasting joy that helps me understand that even if everything around me crumbles, it's okay because I'm just going home. We can say the things that Paul wrote about in Philippians chapter 1 that for me to live is Christ but to die is gain. That regardless of what happens here to this physical body, to my physical possessions, as long as I go home, 
What's he tell the brethren at the church at Rome? That the suffering of this present age is not to be compared with the glory that's to come? You see, our strength comes from God. The reason why death is gain is because to live is for Christ. But how do we get there? Friends, we've got to keep reading in Philippians. You want to understand joy on a deep level? Read the book of Philippians about a dozen times. It's a quick read. But he tells us in chapter 4, you know that chapter that's misquoted by most of the world, that thinks the strength in Christ is about hitting home runs or dunking basketballs and stuff. Listen, I don't care how much strength Christ gives me, I'm not dunking a basketball. I'm fat and short. It's not happening, okay? But that's not the strength that he's talking about because God doesn't care about a game. What Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4 is that I had to learn to live in excess. And I had to learn to live without. And I was able to learn both of those things in verse 13. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But friends, make no mistake, it is a learned trait. We have to learn to fully depend upon God because if we depend upon ourselves then our life is that roller coaster because some days we're pretty good old boys other days we're awful and so if my disposition is wholly dependent on how good I am that day I'm gonna have good days and bad but if my disposition is dependent upon how good God is all the time I'm a flat line because I don't have to worry about this stuff I don't have to worry about who's getting away with sin because I know God's in control. I don't have to worry about the fact that others seem to prosper and I'm falling behind because God's going to take care of me regardless. I can put those things away, but I've got to learn that my reliance and my dependence comes from God. How's that happen? Come with me to the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 3. And we touched on this a little bit in our sermon on understanding God's mysterious ways, that there's things that God does that we quite frankly just can't get our arms around. Here's another one of these incredible things that we have a little glimpse into. Flip, or, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to start reading in verse 14. Now this is Paul's prayer on behalf of the church at Ephesus. And I want you to listen to how Paul explains how we really get strength. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I want us to break down a couple of quick things here in this prayer. One, this is what Paul prayed for. So do you think it's probably something you and I should pray for too? I think so. I think if Paul is thinking enough to pray about this on behalf of the church at Ephesus, you and I should pray like this too. Secondly, how do we get that strength in the inner man? Well, I pray to God. I ask for that strength in the inner man. But this is not strength that comes from something I do. It's from something... God does. Through his spirit, he may grant you to be strengthened with power in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that us being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with the fullness of God. What he's saying is that this concept that helps us being rooted and grounded in love, is it takes supernatural, spiritual strength to understand how much God loves us. 
to understand how much Jesus loves us. That it's something that we need to, be, to have strength in the inner man, and we get that via the Holy Spirit. Now, do I have any idea how any of that stuff works? Nope. I also can't explain to you how the internal combustion engine of my car works. But I can tell you when I turn the key, it comes on and I drive. I don't have to know exactly how God does this. But Paul explains very clearly that if I pray and ask God, he's the one that's going to do it. And he says, I need that strength to be able to overcome these difficult things. That if I want to choose joy, if I want to have a life that's filled with joy and not dependent upon my circumstances, I need God. And when I need God, he answers. Because he loves me. And he loves me more than I have the ability to understand. I'm going to say that one one more time. God loves me more than I have the ability to understand. And that may be the most peaceful thing that we can ever read in Scripture. Is that he loves me in spite of me. He loves me in spite of how bad I can be at times. And he loves me so much, it's, I can't get my brain around it. That he has to help me and give me strength to get my mind around how much he loves me. So however much you think God loves you, it's infinitely more. Because we can't understand it. That's why, friends, we can choose joy in the midst of circumstances. I can choose joy in the midst of calamity because I understand how much my God loves me. And if he was willing to do everything that he's already done, why wouldn't he take care of me from here? If he takes care of my biggest problem, which is sin that I can do nothing about, why wouldn't he take care of me from here? Why do I have to be worried? Why do I have to have anxiety? Why do I have to be up worried about who's right and who's wrong? I can put all those things aside if I'll spend time with him. If I'll pray for that strength. If I'll do my part by listening to him and talking to him. If I'll build that relationship, that's where that strength in the inner man comes from. Is the work that we do in building that relationship with God. So friends, the lesson is yours and the choice is as well. This morning as we have opportunity, will you choose joy? Will you continue to let your life be dictated by your circumstances or will you choose joy? Will you continue to be tossed on the wind, tossed on the seas, or will you choose joy? The choice of joy starts very simply with just getting to know God. The more we learn about him, the more we trust him, the more we'll love him. That love, that trust allows us the confidence that it takes to let go of the world, the cares of the world, the concerns of the world, to embrace Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And to die with him, having all of our sins washed away, rising to take hold of newness of life, being selfless, going around while God's patient and being salt and light to others, helping them see God's love, God's mercy, and God's redemption. That despite whatever we've done, there's always a path back home. And then we spend more time with God, we learn more about him, we trust him even deeper, we love him on levels unimaginable. We turn further away from the world and the cares of the world, deeper into Jesus, putting to death the sin in our members and in our bodies so that we can be more selfless, more helpful to others, more salt and more light. I don't know why that's blinking behind me. Again, the plea is, what's your choice? Will you choose joy or will you choose the world? Make that choice now while we stand and while we sing.